Today, we're talking about the service mesh. So, the service mesh is quite a, um, a technical um, system, and I'm going to try and not get too technical, mainly because I don't understand it all enough to be that technical. Um, so, I'm going to try and pitch this at a higher level. More in terms of what does this mean for us? How does this affect the way we think about our market? So, hands up, in, anyone who's ever heard of the service mesh? Not enough, in, so enough from Roger. I read a bit about it, maybe. I might be wrong. I don't know. Yeah, that everyone's involved. Okay, I'm gonna, I'll dive into the detail, and then we, we can go into it. So, who here works with microservices? Well, so, you've worked with microservices before. Okay. Because traditionally, historically, we haven't really worked with them much. I mean, I think as a thing, it's only been spoken about since about 2015, from, from what I recall. So today we're going to start off just by looking at monolithic versus microservices. And this picture tells it all. <laughs> so um, when, I was, when I was at Gift, we built a very big monolith. And um, it got very complex over time as we kept adding new features and new business elements to it. And, um, but at a certain point, once we were acquired, we had to find ways to integrate with the other systems. And it was only at that point that we started thinking about microservices as, as a solution to, to handle all the complexity. It was very hard for us to fix our monolith. So monoliths normally use some form of layered architecture that we all used to. And so we almost, you know, we, we actually break up our teams into these different layers. So we'd have a front-end team and a back-end team and a database and persistence group. And you can create various layers. Um, but then we think about people, actually, in terms of those layers. Um, and, okay, so there are some very bad aspects to monoliths, but I'm first going to talk about the good. And that is, um, when you're building something for the first time, it doesn't seem to make sense to build them using a microservices system, because microservices themselves are quite complex to set up and operate and run. And I'll go more into that as we go. So, um, so you would naturally build a monolith, but it would be a little mon a mini monolith. Um, and that's the fastest way to build stuff. It's the easiest, it's the most natural for us to do, and probably advisory, advised, at least until Tricks came along. Um, but some of the problems with monoliths are, um, when they get really big, at, at large scale, um, it gets very hard to work with them. You know, they're, they're not very flexible. All the different pieces are dependent on many other different pieces, and that becomes very, very complicated. Um, and because of that, it makes it harder to scale, because in order to scale the monolith, you have to make changes. And when you want to make changes, you have to, every single um, person on the team has to speak to every other person on the team to kind of, can we make this change? Can we make that change? And it actually becomes harder to use. Um, so it slows down the development process as this thing gets bigger. Um, so on the right is kind of what you see. You, you know, if we look at what we really have, it's a whole pile of spaghetti. But if we can make it look like beautiful magic just by having a beautiful UI and all the all the sins are hidden under under the hood. Um, so so these are some of the challenges. I know there's a whole lot of them on one screen, but um, there's a concept called the big ball of mud, which I think comes from d um, domain dri driven de design. It's like this complex thing that we just don't understand. And the bigger this thing gets, the harder it is for, for the humans to understand this thing. So as we said, small changes take weeks or months, even the smallest thing. Um, which means we can't easily do that. We can't actually reuse code very easily. Um, we, ha we actually have to grow our teams bigger and bigger and bigger to, to deal with, with growth. So like if I look at, um, at Twitter, I mean, they had like, trouble in the early stages. So they just kept growing people because they didn't have a really good way to actually handle the multiple services they actually needed to run that because they built it poorly in the, in the, early, in the early stage. Um, if you have technical debt, it's very hard to fix because, again, as you... As you make changes here, it affects this and affects that, and the whole team has to be involved. Um, you know, it's very hard to, to scale, as we mentioned. Um, but also, everyone in the company needs to know everything about the whole co code base, because if you don't, you, you actually risk stepping on somebody else's toes. Um, and that makes you very dependent on some of the, of the key devs in the company. If one of them had to leave, they would take away all this knowledge, and then you would have to think, how on earth do we even manage this code base? But if you want to bring new people on board into the company, you have to train them. And it takes a long time to be upskilled. But not only that, the existing people have to train new people. So it's, it's doubly slow. Yeah, doubly slow. Um, cool. So I'm just going to touch again on Conway's Law. I know we bring this up every now and again. 
But Conway's law says that organizations which, des which de design systems produce copies of the, of the communication structures of the organization in the way that you build that. And on the right, you can see different organizations. And, and it's kind of a funny thing, but it's kind of true. This is how those organizations tend to operate and the code bases operate too. The Microsoft one looks very <laughs> scary. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's new Microsoft or old Microsoft. Um, I'm just bringing this up because a lot of my thinking around the complexity of things and technology is how does it work with the organization? And how are we solving that problem? How's the world solving that problem? And what are we doing in Trickster to try and solve that problem too? I don't think we should always isolate this in terms of just technology. I think we should be thinking of teams and groups. So, you know, in the in the journey towards microsystems, you know, we, we've gone from monolithic systems where you have a single unitary code base towards, uh, you know, s service oriented thinking, service oriented architecture, which kind of fill the gap. And so in this in this diagram, you can see that the, the, the trend is to a single um, code base to maybe a slightly more chunky but separate services and then ultimately microservices. There's no clear definition of what a microservice really is. People talk about it, they use them in some ways, but there's very different views on what they are. A microservice could be a very specific um, service around some kind of domain, um, but it could be a very minute thing. It could be almost like a nano service. And, um, but I mean, I tend to think of it as, as, a, as a usable system. I mean, if you wanted a function to be a service, you know, A plus B equals C, that doesn't really make sense. You know, so it's got to be something which actually has some form of chunky meatiness to it. But it can't be this massive thing that itself is like a bloated piece of, of code. Um, and and um, so, and I think in the company, nobody really knows what's the right size for a microservice. But if you use things like domain-driven design, you can start thinking about the context and domains of things, and then the services start becoming more clear. Um, but one thing you can think, maybe think about is that a team could build a microservice. You could have a whole separate team of three to maybe seven people, ten people, um, focus on one microservice. And that team only focuses on that particular service. They don't really care about the rest of the organization's systems or any other services necessarily. They, they could focus on a microservice. In a startup like ours, it's very hard to actually do that. So we, we would necessarily want to think about microservices maybe differently. But in a larger organization, I think that's how we tend to go. Um, so just to kind of re review the way you would look at monolithic architecture versus microservices architecture. On the left, you have the layered approach where maybe you would think of teams being in those different layers. But on the right, you can start seeing how you could have microservices. And each microservice manages maybe its own data and, and persistence itself. It, it could manage its own UI, actually, itself. Um, and so on, on, on some form of greater UI, you might have different teams managing their, their piece of the UI. But then there's a way of actually of, um, co combining all of that together in a single client interface, for example. Um, so I'm going to just talk about some of the benefits of microservices. Um, I'm going to start with organizational agility. So, so what you could have, as I said before, is you could have separate teams that are very agile in how they do things, focusing on, on, on a particular microservice. Um, and this, this can lower the, the cost to companies um, because instead of having this monolithic group where everyone's talking to everyone, you can, you can create a separation of concerns so people can focus very much on their own area and they can move quickly. And changes they make to their service doesn't affect anybody else as long as the interface to each service is consistent. And where the interface itself changes, if they can publish that information to, to other groups that are using that, who, who are dependent on some level. Um, and obviously this also means that there's less dependency on like one person to be the superhero across everything. Then each team just has its own key people. And obviously that would make it easier to onboard new people because they would come into maybe one particular service and then they can very quickly be up, uh, um, up to speed. Um, another ben the other benefits are around coding. Because the microservices are decoupled, it becomes easier to build and manage. It's actually easier to, to fix the technical debt because you're in one place and you can actually fix it in, in a fairly straightforward way. Um, it also allows, uh, allows you to have code efficiency and reuse of code you know, more clearly than if it's just in a huge monolith. Um, scaling. So scaling is a critical element. Obviously, every business wants to scale. And if you inhibit it from scaling, like Twitter maybe was in the early period, it pisses off the 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 users of your application, and you know it's very hard to actually build a good rapport with your your users. 
I think Twitter had something called fail well, where they, no. yeah, where they, they'd, in a friendly way, just kind of keep their users happy to some degree, just by giving them interesting cartoons. So, um, by by creating a separation, in theory, we create more re resilient systems. Um, if you have downtime, instead of having a monolith going down and you have to try and figure out all the different pieces to, to make it work, you might just find the downtimes in one of your services and you can quickly fix that. Um, you can scale on, on demand easier because you can you can find better ways to actually do scaling um, through, uh, on, the, on the infrastructure level. It also means that you can be more adaptable as a company because you can actually make changes in many different services simultaneously. Um, you can you can have you know continuous integration and de delivery of those um, because you're actually making just changes in certain key areas. As long as again you don't change the interface into each service, um, it doesn't really affect anybody else. And because you can do that, you can develop easier, you can deploy easier, you can do these things faster. You actually can engage your your end user better. So you can actually get feedback from your user base and start making changes very easily. And because your, your users see constant improvements over time, it actually makes them feel better as users rather than just being stuck in one system where they, where they can't actually see changes and when they're bugs, they actually don't see them being fixed fast enough. So microservices solves everything, right? <laughs> yeah, no, not really. Because there, there's, a, there's a problem with microservices that I'm going to dive into and that is complexity. So it's very easy when you have five microservices, ten microservices. You can just write code to orchestrate these things together. Um, but what happens when you have like dozens or hundreds or maybe even thousands of microservices? Like companies like Amazon and, and Netflix just have these massive amounts of microservices. And this is a, a real, okay, it's very fuzzy, but it's a real visual. Um, it, it actually shows a whole, a whole bunch of these services interoperating. It looks a little bit like mud to me. Exactly. <laughs> it starts getting muddy it's again. <laughs> Because now you have all these different teams and all these different services and, you know, how do you make all these things work together? Who even decides how to do that? And how do you figure out all the dependencies and who has access to what? It becomes quite hard to, to work with. So I'm going to just briefly talk about the Grumman X29. I don't know if you've seen this in, in, the, in, the, in the news lately. So I think, I think it was in CNN like a week or two ago. So this is an interesting airplane because if you look at the wings, they're back to front. Instead of having wings that flare out the back, they actually flare out in the front. So what that does is it allows the aircraft, firstly it lets them become very economical in space, they can fit a pilot in like a much smaller space, they can probably make it lighter, but it's very maneuverable, it's incredibly maneuverable. Um, but with great maneuverability comes great complexity. <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually, it's, it's impossible for a human to pilot this plane. Because um, it, it's just, it, it just doesn't work. The, the aerodynamics just work differently. And you, as a human, you'd have to make 40 changes a second to the way you would normally do things. Um, and you'd have to be aware of many, many different um, elements. You'd have to be monitoring the, the environment like crazy. So the only way this thing flies, and it flies really well, you know, it's really great for like fighting and all that kind of stuff. But it needs a computer to make those 40, average 40 changes a second just to kind of not crash. <laughs> so, but it's an example of how do you, of, you know, we actually need systems to help us with complexity, you know, and the more complex things get, we're going to need more computerized systems to actually help us manage that. So that's my foray into the amazing service mesh. So that's the topic of our talk. So we're talking about services. The service mesh is a way to help manage the complexity of microservices. So, okay, I'll just read this out. It's, it gives you configurable infrastructure layer for a microservices application. So you have all these different services, but there's an infrastructural element and there's an orchestration of all, all these different services that we have to manage. And that's what the service mesh does. So from the human perspective, if we look at the way these different teams operate, there's teams operating different services, but there is a platform that is the overarching thing around this. And so the, uh, the platform owner can have a separate concerns from the, service, from the services owners. So each services owner has their own specific service they have to deal with, but the platform owner has a different problem. And, this, and service mesh gives tools to the platform owner to be able to orchestrate these different systems and to understand what's going on. So just to get slightly technical, <laughs> I'm going to just dive into the concept of a sidecar. Has anybody heard of the sidecar pattern? Okay, it's somewhat obscure. Just from you. Uh, yeah, so I've, I've mentioned it once or twice lately. Um, so when you have a service, so, so on the left-hand side you have your service, 
And then you have your sidecar, which, which attaches to the service. And the sidecar is actually a proxy for the service. And the sidecar allow, in this case, it, it's, it's probably not the, 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 the right way around because the, the sidecar is the thing that, that manages the service. And I'm going to go into a bit more detail on that. So, so here's, a, here's an example of a pattern. So at the bottom, we see the service mesh control and plan. That's the plan that orchestrates the different services. And instead of having code within, within each service that helps to orchestrate each service, I mean, in theory, what you could do is you could have every service owner has to put in code so that some kind of control system can actually manage that service. But the problem with that is that that code, every time there's a version change, every single service would have to change its versions. Um, to to allow for that control plane to actually interoperate. So what so what happens instead is we have a proxy. So every single service has a proxy called a sidecar, and that proxy manages the service. But that proxy then has capabilities to be orchestrated by the the larger um, orchestration plane. Is that um, clear? Okay. Um, so some of the key areas that the sidecar can help manage is the authentication and um, and authorization. So that means the service itself doesn't have to worry about like you know who has the rights to use me. It's just an open service that can be used. Um, but the the sidecar allows for the authentication there to operate across multiple different services, and that's actually very important. Um, there's also monitoring of each service. So the sidecar can actually get you know, telemetry information coming, emanating from all these different services. And that monitoring information can then be made visible to the orchestration layer and the platform layer. And that's that's a very critical factor. Um, from, from a security point of view, um, also the sidecar could, um, could actually create certificates and do encryption across these different services without the service having to worry about how that works. So any information that comes in and out of those services it could be in plain text or whatever it is. You can create all kinds of encryption around that, so that from a from a almost a centralized place, you can just determine how how the encryption and decryption actually works across these different services. Um, what the sidecar then allows is it allows the developers to rather code features that add business value and not worry about this infrastructural element. Um, and so all the infrastructure is in managed through the service mesh. And the individual programmers don't have to worry about that aspect at all. It's, it just abstracts that away from them. So just to run through some of the advantages, it gives monitoring and scalability. We also you can also do rate limiting. So you can you can be monitoring and then determining should we be rate limiting certain services because it's getting too high to peak or there could be issues around them. So you can do rate limiting. Um, the end-to-end -end, um, encryption. Also, the, the service mesh gives you the capabilities of service discovery because it's aware of every single service. So anybody that needs to use services can actually use the discovery tools to figure out what how they should be working with this. And particularly the, the platform owner because they can actually determine what services do we have available to us. Um, and I, I've mentioned the roles-based security management. So then you can have canary deployments where you can actually have services running but then you can have a deployment of a platform where you can say, well, I'm just testing this to see if this dies or not. You know? And then, so you can have a certain deployment which, which doesn't change the services, but it could change maybe an application that runs across the services. Similarly, you could have AB, um, um, AB testing around this. So if you use Kubernetes, from what I understand, you can also create AB testing, but it just does 50-50. But with service meshes, you can say, well, I want 10%, 90%, I want 2%, 98%. And you can, you can actually determine how much um, people with certain clients, maybe 2% of them get some of the new services and some of them don't, and, and that type of thing. Um, and in general, this, this then lowers operational complexity. So some of the challenges of Service Mesh, though, are it's a technical, it's pretty much a technical um, solution to a very technical problem. But it doesn't necessarily think about the organization itself. And so when, when we start to think about, you know, how do we help the organization? I go back to, um, to um, you know, domain-driven design. And I go back to Conway's law, which is how does the organization fit into this? How do the business people within the organization think about this? So service, the service mesh, for me, it's, it's grown a lot, and it's improved the way you work with microservices. And, and, the, and the new service meshes now actually deal with API management as well. So they can deal with your internal microservices, the outside world, 
and over time you can do almost anything with it but but there's still complexity in in, in designing the system certainly on the platform level how do you think about this how do you actually model this and that has not been addressed yet by the service mesh and that's actually where trickster comes in because not only are we i mean the, the one point i maybe i haven't pushed strong enough is that in many ways we are like a service mesh and it may not be that obvious yet but we also connect with different services we also i mean i'm not sure we're using the, the concept of a side of a sidecar proxy fully yet but that's something we should be thinking about is how do we then how do we then use the the concepts of service mesh within the trickster environment but further to that we also have the capability of modeling um, business thinking around the service mesh and then autonomously spinning up and managing these different systems without even needing to um, you know think about the technical aspects of it solely um, and that's really what I think Trickster ultimately will bring to this new way of thinking around service meshes. Because I think service meshes are still new and people are beginning to get used to them. There are many different service meshes. I mean, Google's got um, um, Istio and you know Microsoft have got a mesh of meshes. And um, there are different groups who look at all these different meshes now thinking, well, we need one way to handle all these different meshes. So they're coming up with kind of an aggregator of meshes. Um, Amazon's got their own mesh system, which uses exactly the same patterns, but that's closed to Amazon. It's not an open source system. They use it to run all their different services. <clears throat> but I think what's still missing and will, and will become clearer, and I can, I can already see it's becoming clearer, because people are talking about how do you model these service meshes. And I saw an interesting talk, which I'll send the link out, where they say, if you're building a service mesh, if you're not using DDD, you, you're wasting your, your, your time with it. So people are starting to see we actually need a modeling system to model the organizational and the business requirements. And I think that's actually where Trickster can actually come in over time. So part of our positioning um, is to look at the, the way that service meshes are being sold in the world as a solution to certain things. And in a way, that's what we do. But we go one step further, and that's it. We actually model the organization. Thank you. And that's the end of my brief introduction to service meshes in Trickster. Um, but I'm opening up the floor to any questions. Just don't get too technical on me. Hit me. At the moment in Kubernetes, we have we have quite a bit of this. Or we have the ability to maintain a cluster, the pods that run the cluster, and there's a lot of like overhead for inter-cluster management, communications, authentication roles, all that, all that kind of stuff. The one major difference here is that with the sidecar architecture, they're all there's inter into sidecar communication is happening that then maps against those individual solution spaces or roles to which might exist. But they all actually communicate with a single um, control plane. What do you, that, that control plane doesn't exist in Kubernetes. There's no way to manage all of them besides like their own community dashboard or whatever. Where does that fit in with what we're doing at the moment? So generally all service meshes use Kubernetes and Docker. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like a standard. So they'll use the capabilities of what it does offer. But it's another level of, of abstraction above it. And, and that's where the sidecar proxy is coming in. You know, there's, there's the data plan, there's the orchestration plan. Do you see this as something that's managed by our Kubernetes instances or from within tricks the space as our own version of the sidecar? I think it's our own version. You know, we can, we can orchestrate using Kubernetes too, like, like they do in other uh, meshes. Um, but I think it's different. And I think there's an abstraction there that we... We, that we can use that's similar to the service mesh and we, and we have other abstraction nodes as well that I think we need to impose upon this so and also um, I mean Kevin isn't actually on, the, on a call uh, I'm guessing but um, Kevin Kevin also looks into service meshes and, and his view is that we can orchestrate service meshes too so if there are service meshes we could be a, 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 I mean us could actually orchestrate other service meshes but we are, we are still one level higher which is modeling the organizational structures in the business one thing that I was wondering if you had any thoughts on was, um, I mean, I think it's, <coughs> you have to think about interfaces changing often because, I mean, there's not much real functionality you can add without changing some interface of some service somewhere. Like, a lot of the code that you, features that you add or bugs that you fix or whatever involves interface changes. So, um, if you have this service mesh and you're changing a particular service and now instead of like, if you have a monolith, you sort of have one team or code base or whatever to sort of make make the changes to comply with the new interface. 
but now you have to notify the service owners of like 20 or 30 other services that rely on your interface how, how do you um how does that work um have you been able to find out yeah so the one thing about the service mesh is um it can see all the dependencies so that's useful because at least you know who to identify who to notify and something I think I've seen in service meshes, they almost want to see who is the person they should be contacting so they can automate the contacting. But what you can also do with the service mesh is you can have two versions running simultaneously. So you can have the new version and the old version in the same way that we could do as well. And so, so certain people that want to use the new version could actually start working on the new version. And, and other people could still be on the old version until they're ready to move off the old version. So I, th I think it's that kind of stuff where you actually have multiple ver versions running. For a variable that reading I did, um, you can do you can run parallel sidecars, so you can run two different sidecars, and the service mesh slowly starts switches over to the second side to the new sidecar, and once everyone switched over, you can shut down the old one. But you can run sidecars in parallel that way, so yeah. like different versioning of the API. And also the other thing, and this ties into the um, the platform owner. Um, if if you look at a yeah if you look at a um, if we use say Etherscan or Twitter's API or any well known service that that's out there, like we don't really get to influence what features they have. We get to like just use what they offer. Like we're not influencers of those services, right? So if we find that <coughs> Etherscan isn't doing something we want to do. We can either have Barry send them a very um, strong <laughs> number of email, <laughs> or we can just um, suck it up, you know. So, like, how does if if you have a service and you, you realize, okay, well, like, I'm gonna have to implement, I'm gonna have to provide this new functionality because the platform demands it of me. Like, whose whose job is it? But then I realize, oh, but I need this other service to give me new information, or I need like these two other services to to not do this or to whatever like how does the how does the how do you then like poke them to say hey like other service i need this or is it up to the platform owner to like orchestrate the dependencies that are going to be needed for any new feature across all services yeah so i think it can get complicated because i think the platform owner definitely will be pushing people to make changes to the services but there could be one service that is maybe in some ways dependent on a different service um you know and, and it might be through the mesh itself but they might have a relationship and i think in those cases they may speak directly to them it may not be something that even needs to be known by the platform it could just be that my service needs your service and or maybe I need to swap out, you know, I'm, I'm using a certain API for one service, I could swap that out for another. I think that's up to the service owner and not yeah. necessarily the platform owner. And that's, that's <coughs> like, so the question then becomes, okay, well, if a service is autonomous to decide which features they're going to implement, um, how do they ensure that their goals for the service, you know, meshes, if you'll pardon the pun, with the goals of the platform? Because that's the... Like Twitter can can decide to change their API however way they want, but it's because their clients kind of have a certain demand of them that they that they implement certain features. So, so it's money dictates that. <laughs> so in, in an organization, whoever's paying for the service will have influence over what that service does. So in the case of Amazon, where all of their things are microservices, the money's all coming from the central sales department that's being allocated down so whoever's allocating that money is also incentivized to make sure that there's alignment between what those, serv those services are fulfilling the job that they're supposed to be doing otherwise they shouldn't be paying for it in twitter's case their customers will stop paying for it or they will need to find other customers that will pay for something different if they wanted to change something so a lot of it is driven by who, who will actually pay for what and then that dictates what you need to happen. And, needs to and the people allocating those funds to services for, for implementation have to be technical enough to understand how the system operates at a microservice level. Well, right? yeah, so I think, so. I mean, what's interesting is that, you know, a platform owner may want a certain kind of functionality and may work with the service um, owner to provide that. But they won't dictate how you do it. And so I think that's left, to, and it depends on the organization. If it's a small organization, they may still have some impact on how. But in, in these very large organizations like Netflix, they won't tell them how to do it. And in fact, in many, well, in some organizations, you have a polyglot environment where you have different languages being used by different service providers. As long as the interface is standardized, 
you don't really have to dictate that you have to use Java or C or something else. And then, okay, and then the last question is, how, what is it that prompts the creation of new services the dying off of services or the splitting or merger of services. So, like, how does because that's not something that stays constant, right? Yeah, I think um, it comes back to Roger's point around the economics. Yeah, the economics. So <laughs> because, because yeah. um, you may have a, I mean, like Netflix will have a service, I don't know, which figures out your favorite type of show, you know, maybe, and and that may be very useful, but it may have other services which I don't know. Look at your 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 billing address, and it might be a very simple service that it doesn't really need much much work in it, or it might switch to some other system, and, and that one has no real use, and then you don't actually use it anymore. If it's not being used, nobody's going to pay you to carry on building that. So then, obviously, that team can can dissipate and move into other teams as well. So, but it does lend itself to that kind of team thing where you can actually maybe move around and, and join other teams if your particular service isn't that important right now. It may still be important, but not changing anymore. So, okay, so basically the, the point that I'm hearing from this is that there has to be an element of budgeting across services. So in, in, in a monolith, you have a management team and sort of which trickles down requirements to everyone and then that dictates what gets built. Whereas in a service mesh, kind of the, there's money or even like notional money that flows between services to incentivize them to to kind of stay, keep doing what they're doing, or die off, or... And I, and I think that's the goal. And to be honest, I think that's the, go that's the future goal of an organization, is to have different elements and groups, you know, whether they work directly for you or they're outsourced or whatever. If, it's, if what they're doing is of value to the greater system, and, they're in, and, and there's, um, it's economically viable, then that actually is what drives it. It's, it's, tr it's probably truer than just determining we want features. You know, it's hard to do when you're just starting out, but at a certain point, as you become, as you reach maturity, you don't want features. You want to you want to be driven by the the unit economics of the the greater organization. Okay, that's the control I think that ultimately does fall to down, and it's, and it's not it's not command and control. It's just kind of it's the it's the natural influence I think. Incentivize. Yeah, and you know maybe in the long run, in the future of organizations where there's a crypto that moves around, maybe that's the thing that actually helps manage that, that, that the actual value, the actual value of what you're doing and the unit economics of that. So I, I read a lot of stuff about like um, where you have in organizations where you have an IT department that is a cost center, um, you sort of have a notional <coughs> budget allocated to every other department to use the services of the IT department. And then the IT department almost operates like a little autonomous business with customers, even though the money is staying within the same organization. It's like they, they, they get revenue, notional revenue from departments, which kind of force people to apply economic uh, thinking to what do the priorities of things, because there's a real cost associated with, um, there's only so much sort of notional tokens or whatever to go around so the the use of that service has to be um figured out in the same way that you figure out a household budget or anything. yeah uh, amazon takes that to the extreme where each division like warehousing or their search or their servers or whatever needs to have for any new division that they build up within two or three years they have to have 30 percent of their revenue from outside amazon departments amazon's departments so what they do is they force that Units or that microservice or that functional unit within the organization to actually be efficient and use its own cost accounting to make sure it's cost competitive in, in the general market. And and by that, 80 to 70 or 80 percent of their work is still for the Amazon core, which means that the, the Amazon as a whole, all of their services are cost competitive in the market as standalone services. And so that's and that's why AWS spun out as a whole separate business is because from the outset they've had a mandate to make this something that can be competitive in the glow in the in the in the rest of the market. Yeah. And I think I mean I think I mean lots of companies have this idea of notional charges. But I think what could be interesting in the future is where it's not notional. It's actually real. And they charge internally as well as externally, similar to what Amazon does. Because that actually really makes them question their, their choices of features yeah. and that type of thing. Cool. It's gotta be real. Cool. Well thanks everyone. And that was just like an introduction, and um, 
I'm trying to get my head around how this can help us describe what we do to outside companies as well. So any ideas you have? Feel free. Thank you. Cool. Thank you.